So we just talked about kind of more formally defining these simulation-based estimators that really are just, just pretty, pretty simple logical analogs of the traditional estimators that we've talked about before. Now let's talk about the properties of those estimators. So it's going to be easiest to, to, to think through these properties if we set up a little new notation here. So this might get a little confusing thinking through the notation, but at the end, I think we'll see why it's useful to set things up this way. And so we can think about these traditional estimators, whether it's maximum likelihood or, or method of moments or generalized method of moments, as being the set of parameters that solves a specific system of functions that's expressed as a sample mean. And what I mean by that is there's going to be some function that we can take at the kind of individual level, which is this g sub n. And it's, it's either a function or a system of functions. Um, g sub n. We're going to average that thing over the entire population, or sorry, over the entire sample, all n individuals that we observe. And that's going to get us this function g. And our estimator is going to be the set of parameters that makes that g function or set of functions equal to zero. That's all very abstract. Let's look at our two specific examples. And I think this will make sense. For maximum likelihood estimation of a discrete choice model, our g sub n functions here is this. We're going to sum over all alternatives y sub ni, remember this is one for the alternative that's chosen, zeros for those that's not. So basically we're just going to take just the chosen alternative. We're going to take the choice probability for that chosen alternative, log it, and then take the derivative with respect to every, uh, every one of the parameters. So this is just that first order condition that we, that we talked about in the last video. And, and basically that we talked about back when we talked about maximum likelihood uh, you know, many weeks ago. So all we're saying here is just that there's a way that we can express this first order condition uh, at the individual level. And then our estimator is the set of parameters that takes the means of all of those individual level functions. And it's gonna be the set of parameters that sets those equal to zero. This is just kind of a weird way of basically getting at our our, our first order conditions, but we'll see on the next slide why we're writing things down this way. We can also think of GMM as fitting into this kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, structure. Uh, the individual level function for GMM is just kind of the moment, our, our moment conditions at the individual level rather than taking the average over all individuals. So you can think about this as like an individual specific moment. And then when we kind of average up to the full sample, the, our estimator is going to be the set of parameters that makes that kind of total sample average moment equal to zero. So once again, these are just kind of slightly different ways of expressing things we've already talked about. And, and, and I think if you sat down with, with uh, you know, at a whiteboard or with some with a pen and paper, we could definitely see why the, these, these equal exactly the same thing we showed before. And of course, we talked about in, in detail previously that when certain assumptions are met, pretty weak assumptions in most cases, uh, these estimators yield consistent estimates of the true set of parameters theta, theta sub zero. So our theta hat the theta that solves this expression in general is going to be a consistent estimate, estimator for our true set of parameters, theta sub zero. Okay, that was still just talking through traditional estimators, right? We didn't talk about simulation at all there. So now let's talk about the simulation-based analogs, the simulation-based estimators that are similar to the ones we just described. We can think about simulation-based estimators in exactly the same way. It's just that instead of having, let's flip back, instead of having these G functions that depend on choice probabilities, they're gonna be these check G, these simulated Gs that are gonna depend on simulated choice probabilities. But still the same thing is gonna hold. We're gonna average up those simulated functions, average those up throughout the, our entire sample and our, uh, 
uh, estimators, our simulation-based estimators, are going to. It's going to be the set of parameters that solves this simulated function, setting it equal to zero. So once again, we're just kind of swapping out the choice probabilities uh, and swapping in simulated choice probabilities. And then we're just calling kind of everything that follows from that as being simulated functions instead of actual functions. But the reason we've spent the last five minutes defining all of these things is because it's gonna give us a nice way to express how our simulation-based functions, these check Gs differ from the actual Gs on the previous slide. And so I wrote down the math here, just so you can see there's no sleight of hand. We're really just, this is pretty straightforward. We can say that that check G, the simulation-based functions equals the simulation-based functions. Okay, that, that's just definitionally true, obviously. Then we're gonna add and subtract G the uh, the traditional function, the non-simulated function, the, the, the function that depends on the actual choice probabilities instead of the simulated choice probabilities. But we're going to add and subtract that thing. So, so that's not changing anything, right? We're adding and subtracting the same thing. That's just equal to zero on net. Then we're going to add and subtract one more term. What we're going to add and subtract is this expectation. This is the expectation of the simulated G function over all of our simulation draws. So we're saying, uh, you know, as we simulate things, that's gonna be based on these random draws. So what we, our actual G functions here are gonna depend on our simulated choice probabilities, which depend on the actual random draws of beta that we get when we simulate the choice probabilities. Well, since that's a random process, we could think about taking an expectation over that thing. And that's what this expectation term is here. So once again, we've just got G check equals G check plus and minus G plus and minus the expectation of G check. So we haven't actually you know, kind of changed anything yet. But we've written it down this way because we're going to be able to rearrange all of the terms in a way that makes some sense. And I've, I've got it on the next slide also, and I describe it there. So we're going to be able to say that G check our simulated functions equals the traditional non-simulated functions plus the expectation of G check minus the actual G plus G check minus the expectation of G check. And each of these terms in parentheses here is gonna have a nice intuition that will help us understand how our simulated functions differ from those real traditional functions. In this first term here, we're taking the expectation of our simulated function minus the actual function. So what this is telling us is in, in expectation, how will our simulated value differ from the tr real traditional value? When we talk about how does some, something differ from its real value in expectation, normally when we define something that way, we're talking about bias. And so what this term right here is gonna give us is how might these simulated functions be biased when compared to the, the real function. So we're having to do some simulation. Let, let, let me just re-say what we're doing here. Just make sure we haven't gotten lost in all the notation and the math, right? What we really wanna do is calculate these Gs and find the set of parameters that makes G equal to zero. We can't do that for some reason. Some piece of G is just too complicated and we have to simulate it instead. So we're gonna end up with these simulated G functions instead of the actual G functions. This term here is telling us what's the, over all of our possible simulation draws, what is the expectation of those G, those simulated G functions. And if that thing differs, if the expectation of our simulation differs from the actual value, then we're gonna call that simulation bias. And obviously we want things to not be biased in general. <laughs> 
So that's the first set of terms here. The second set of terms here is how the simulated function differs from its own expectation. So we're saying here, even if you know the simulation is right on average, because we're making these random draws, any particular simulation could actually be kind of off from that expectation. And we're gonna call that simulation noise. And so for both of these reasons, simulation bias and simulation noise, our simulation-based estimator can differ from that traditional estimator that we, would, that we would really like to achieve. And so how do we reduce simulation bias and simulation noise in our simulation-based estimators? Well, to reduce simulation bias, we need to increase the number of simulation draws. So as we have more and more simulation draws, our expectation of the simulation is gonna to converge to its true value. So as we have more and more simulation draws, as capital R increases, the expectation of the simulation is gonna to converge to the true value and the simulation bias term is gonna to converge to zero. What about simulation noise? How do we think about reducing that? Well, it turns out here, as we increase our sample size, capital N, we're reducing simulation noise. It's kind of like if any individual has some noise in their own simulation, well, as we have more and more individuals in our data set, then any kind of noise that any one individual is contributing you know, that's gonna kind of count for less and less. And so as we have more and more uh, individuals, more and more, you know, decision makers in our data set, this kind of simulated G function will converge to its expectation. And so it's enough R and enough N, we are going to get some nice properties for our simulation-based estimators. If we have a sufficient number of simulation draws and we have a sufficient sample size, then our system simulation-based estimators are going to be consistent. So that's great. That's kind of the, the bare minimum that we usually want for an estimator. They're gonna be asymptotically normal. So that's also good. That means we're gonna be able to calculate uh, you know, a variance, uh, the, 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 the asymptotic variance of our estimator. And actually sometimes these traditional uh, uh, these simulation-based estimators are going to be either equivalent to or converging to the traditional analog. So that's really great. We know that the traditional estimators have some really nice properties. And so the fact that we can recreate those properties with our simulation-based estimator and maybe even get our simulation-based estimator to be equivalent to or converging to those traditional estimators, that's really nice. Uh, the specifics here depend on the actual estimator in question and how you kind of think about your estimator in some different ways. So I'll refer you to the trained textbook for, for some more details on those. But just in general, I wanted to show you that um, through kind of this convoluted math using these G functions, but we finally got there that our simulation best based estimators are consistent, they're asymptotically normal. And even though we're having to simulate things uh, we can often get those simulation-based estimators to be either equivalent or converging to the traditional estimators that we might be more comfortable using. So there's some good properties that we should be happy about with our simulation-based estimators. That's all I've got on kind of the uh, bigger picture stuff. And then in the final video this week, I'm gonna get into some of the details of how to actually do this simulation. I feel like we've still kind of been talking about things at a relatively abstract level. So let's see if you wanna actually simulate choice probabilities and use that to estimate a model, how are we actually gonna do that? And we'll talk about that in this final video.